Hello, I guess no music means we start. Hello, we'll digest together. Um, talking about teens, my name is Christoph. Um, I used to work for TV in the old times with Canal, with Canal Plus, Nick and Disney. Um, now I'm just consulting with the likes of Orange and Ubisoft and the others having money. Um, write books just for fun. Um, and I'm also a farmer. I don't know why they never write that, but I'm a farmer. <laughs> Maybe not very relevant. Um, we'll talk about teens, what, how to deal with them today, and for that we'll start with Donna friedman Meyer, who is the Chief Innovation Officer of Inside Kids. She will make a pre quick presentation about what they are, what they do. Then we'll talk to uh, Bob Higgins, who is the SVP at Fremantle for Kids and Family. And then Nuno Bernardo um, from Be Active, the Managing Director. And sorry, but Munju Kang missed his plane. It's very sorry, but if someone wants to talk about Korea and the fantastic teen stuff happening there, you're very welcome. We'll always have a few questions from you at the end, and you can tweet. In few, after the, all the stuff, you can ask questions if you're shy and don't want to say stupid things like that. You can tweet them and they'll be here. So. Great. Donna, thank you very much for being here. My pleasure, and thank you so much for having us. Um, Inside Kids is a research-driven strategy firm based in New York that really specializes in kids' media and understanding kind of what kids want and need from media. Um, so we thought it would be a good idea to start the day by just talking about like who teens are. Because again, we feel very strongly that to understand and create content that will really connect with your audience, you first need to understand who they are from a developmental point of view, from a cultural point of view, and obviously today we'll, more, we'll dive more specifically into uh, their media usage. So, the big headline. Te teenagehood is a time of extraordinary transformation and connection. Obviously, you know, when you're 13 years old to when you're 19 years old, just pause and think about that for a moment. You're literally going from a kid mind and body to a grown-up mind and body. That's huge. And secondly, it's a huge time of connection. Teens are all about being social and being connected, whether it's being connected to their friends, to their family that they are still starting to move away from, but are still very much grounded in. Uh, to the culture that they produce, and obviously technology is allowing them to um, connect every moment of every day, everywhere um, they want to. So just very quick overview from a developmental point of view, um, socially and emotionally, as I talked about, it's all about their friends. They're aspiring to be like their friends or be um, admired by their friends. They're exploring all parts of their identity, so, um, from a racial, sexual, um, political, religious. They're really trying to figure out what kind of grown-ups they want to be. Um, at 13, they're just starting to get interested in sexual relationships. Um, by 19, they're having sex. Um, and as I said, they are constantly connected and exploring these social connections um, through technology. From a cognitive point of view, they are fully abstract thinkers. They can be planning ahead to, you know, what college do I want to go to? What kind of career do I want to be? They can take the steps to start becoming, again, that grown-up that they want to be. And obviously, from a physical point of view, rage, rage, you know, hormones are raging. Their bodies are, uh, you know, freaking them out on a daily basis. Um, culturally, and so far what I've talked about are really universal truths about teens, no matter where we are in the world. What I'm going to speak about now really speaks to what we've learned um, from our work in the U.S. about what's going on with teens culturally. And so we've identified, and I would love to kind of have a conversation about whether or not you all from all over the world feel like these, these same themes resonate with teens in your markets. Um, so the first is fast fixes. This is the ADHD generation, the multitaskers. Um, they want, you know, they are connected every moment, every day. They want that fast fix. They, you know, they are checking their texts every moment. We have literally heard teens talk about bringing their mobile phones in a Ziploc bag into the shower so they can be texting while they're showering. A little hard for us to understand, but it's happening. Um, smart is the new cool. This is a generation that wants to be challenged. Um, they want layers. They want subtlety. They don't want the obvious. They don't want flat. They really want depth of character and story. Um, and, they, and they can take it. They're smart. 
um, superhero complex. And this one is very much a U.S. Uh, phenomenon. This is the generation that has been brought up to believe they can do anything. They got the gold star for just showing up. So they really have a very bold and kind of big view of what they can do in the world. And they see themselves as entrepreneurs. They see themselves as kind of able to do anything. There are no boundaries for what they can achieve. And finally, life is a game. And that doesn't just mean that they're the video game generation, which they are, but they want to game it all. You know, obviously gamification is a big, I guess we have a game producer in the audience. Um, gamification, it, they want to game marketing, brands, they want to play with your brand and they want to be in on that, those insight, those inside um, secrets and know they've got the best deal. Um, so that's just sort of a, some quick highlights of what's going on for them. In terms of how they're spending their time, um, as you can see, overall television is still dominating with roughly about three and a half hours um, of their daily media usage. Online is right up there with three. Uh, mobiles um, coming up and obviously growing every day with about two hours a day. Video games, about one hour, and other media is another roughly two hours. And in that category includes books, magazines, movies, any other kind of content. Um, and as you can see, the total time of media usage per day is about eight hours and 20 minutes. Now, that does not mean that they are going from one to the other. That eight hours total represents a lot of overlap and, and multitasking. So now quickly just to turn to t teens and transmedia. Um, first of all, it's really important to define what we mean by transmedia. Uh, and when we think about transmedia very much from a teen perspective, we talk about multi-platform experiences inspired by the stuff kids love that helps them do this work of growing up, of connecting and transforming. It doesn't necessarily mean prepackaged franchises, and maybe we'll discuss that more a little bit later. So what we've seen is that in order to have successful transmedia, you need to give teens two things. The first is a meal. This is the meat. It's the characters, the stories, the stakes, the humor that really hits on those themes that I just talked about. Um, so it's about characters that are dealing with issues of, ident of identity. It's got humor and smarts that really challenge them, that aren't just on the surface. It's got stakes that, um, you know, challenge it, both physical stakes and social stakes that challenge that balance of reality and expectation. And just to dive a little bit more deeply on this, um, from a male perspective in particular, and let me just sort of explain this chart, we've got two axes. On the left is drama, on the right is humor, on the top are social stakes, interpersonal relationship stuff, and on the bottom is physical stakes, you know, the, the fall down, funny, pushing yourself. So you can see for boys, it's all about the funny and the physical. So, you know, show properties like Transformers are more in that drama physical area, um, but humor is where so much of what they are consuming dominates. And again, it goes from the more physical, um, silly of, of SpongeBob to, you know, the quite sophisticated family guy, modern family. Um, for female teens, as you can see, they're all in the top. It's all about relationships, identity, connecting, with you know, some being on the more dramatic side, like Pretty Little Liars, and some being on the more uh, comedic side, like Glee or Friends. <clears throat> and the second ingredient that you've got to give teens is lots of snacks. And by snacks, I mean bite-sized, easily digestible, easily shareable, um, little entrees into your content and your world. And so those can take the form of websites and apps and Twitter updates and texts. You know, again, going back to that need for the quick fix and the way to game, that's where the snacks come in. Um, you need to constantly be feeding that hunger and that connection and giving them those, you know, status uh, update worthy bites that they can share with their friends. Um, and finally, just as a kind of quick 
uh, representation of what we mean by a meal and a snack. Uh, the Jersey Shore is a show that's incredibly popular in the U.S. right now because it fits in that quadrant, that upper right quadrant of social humor that appeals to both boys and girls. Um, so here, the meal is television, obviously, um, and all that other stuff. The apps, the shows are a way that kids can connect with, dive deeper into, and showcase their, you know, their in the knownness um, about what's going on with Jersey Shore. And so just to wrap up, um, rem to, so remember, you know, if you want to create really compelling teens transmedia content, you need to give them meals that have characters and story and stakes and humor that really are relevant to what's going on right now in their lives and snacks that keep them engaged, that are small and bite-sized, that are shareable and allow them to game uh, with your brand. And hopefully that, that gets us started. Thank you so much. Well done, Donna. And my three times teen raging hormone says that it's interesting, don't, they don't want flat, the kids. I like the statement, they don't want flat. Good, so I think the big ones now are also interested in that market and producing it. So Fremantle, Bob, we'll, we'll zap a little bit through what you do for teens. What do you think in what the humongous things you're doing, okay. what is targeting kids and getting them, the okay. teens, sorry. Um, we as a company are relatively new to the kids and teen business specifically. The division that I'm with was founded just two years ago. Um, and in that time we, we have launched uh, one successful show. Our first show was targeted toward teens. It's called My Babysitter's a Vampire. Um, and uh, it premiered on Teletoon and Disney Channel uh, this past summer and kind of exploded. Uh, and that is a show, um, thank you very much that um, in terms of transmedia, we, we kind of seeded the marketplace, um, getting the kids excited for, for the show before it ever came out and almost creating an alternate reality um, for them by um, creating a, a fake movie um, called, let's see, I'm gonna run through this thing because it was not meant for this, it was meant for uh, presenting uh, to Teletoon, uh, who, is our, who is our broadcast partner and Disney Channel here in, uh, not here in the States, I'm in France, um, in you the States. You, you woke up too early, thanks to I the I woke up medium. way too early, <laughs> thanks to these guys. Um, so what we did is we created a, a trailer uh, for a movie called Dusk, which is a movie inside of the TV series, and we put it out on YouTube, we put it, we basically threw it out there virally and created, um, you know, basically a reality, and then um, we then uh, launched a website where kids could become fans of Dusk, they could chat about Dusk, um, and Dusk, I mean, it's a fake movie, um, but uh, then when the movie premiered and people were able to kind of buy into it, it helped them buy into the entire reality of our show and uh, hopefully, and I think it proved out in the ratings, engage with the show on a, on a deeper level. Um, the other thing that we did uh, is we created um, basically a, a fighting game um, and you can choose your sides. Do you want to be a vampire or do you want to be... Uh, a human, uh, and, uh, and kids are able to kind of, you know, relate to which they want to be. Inside of our show, the vampires aren't all bad and the humans aren't all good. Um, there's mixtures of both. Um, and this, uh, I think, helped kids understand the show uh, on a deeper level and the characters uh, on a deeper and more uh, impactful level. Um, and it seems to have worked out. But prior to this show, Fremantle as a company, has made a few little shows that have engaged teens on a very, very significant level, particularly in the transmedia area. Uh, one of those is the Idol franchise, um, and the other is the X Factor franchise, uh, as well as the Got Talent franchises. Um, uh, X Factor in the UK has three million Facebook fans. They Facebook while they're watching the show. They chat about, I mean, instantaneously, uh, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, about the contestants, who they like. They can, um, there's an app uh, in, in the UK where you can basically clap, it's tap the clap, um, and basically that's how you uh, can clap for your, for your favorites is you get download this app and you tap it. And that's how you clap, and the more claps the contestants get, the, you know, the greater the vote. Uh, the same thing with, um, with American Idol. Um, this year for the first time you voted uh, on Facebook. You didn't have to, you can vote 
any which way. You can text it, you can call it, but now uh, you can do it on Facebook and you can post on Facebook who you voted for and all your friends can see who you voted for and you can then chat about who you voted for and who you didn't vote for and who you liked. And it just really creates a sense of community and a sense of immediacy and real tactfulness um, for the kids and, and the viewers. Um, and then uh, Got Talent. Um, last year, uh, one of the finalists, she didn't win, um, was a, uh, a little 12-year-old girl named Jackie Ivanko uh, on America's Got Talent, and she submitted her, um, her uh, audition via YouTube. Um, and that's something that we did again this, uh, this past season. YouTube became a major part of how um, auditions happen. Some were definitely live, that's part of the show. You go and, you know, it's fun to see the live auditions with the judges. Um, but YouTube and, and kind of this, you know, uh, self, you know, create a, a what's, the, what's the term? Oh, when you create your own content. User-generated content is such a major part of, of teens and kids. Um, they love making it and being able to give them an opportunity to make it, put it up there, and then end up as a finalist on America's Got Talent um, is pretty significant. Um, so as a company, you know, like I said, we're new to the kids and teens business, but we've been there for the last decade or so, uh, you know, reaching out to these kids and engaging them on a, on a pretty significant way. Thank you very much, Paul. Yeah, <laughs> um, he woke up at 8 o'clock this morning for you. And 80% of the UK teens are double screening. They have, when, while watching you, mm -hmm. they also have another screen. I don't they think that they really understand how to watch TV without touching stuff at the same time. I mean, it's not like us who like to just do this. You know, they're fully engaged all the time. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good. So from the big ones to the newer ones. I mean, not, you're not a dinosaur, sorry, <laughs> just, but darling. But um, the new ones, um, well, you're kind of a dinosaur of the new media. <laughs> yes, um, please you. welcome Nuno, who's going to talk to us a little bit about his experience, experience the last eight years. About producing snacks. Yes, uh, producing uh, snacks. Donna put out, uh, I think Fremantle produces the, the meals. We produce the small snacks that then tries to be the meal. Uh, we have a video that shows what we've been doing the last seven, eight years. So if you could play the video. Recently, a uh, company, we are eight years old, and we start this company to enter this new world um, that was about this entertainment business, where in the past, most of the kids and teens' properties started probably first as a book. Some of the books were then translated to television shows, and then they become an IP property that could expand it to merchandising to video games to other types of products. What changed in the last years is that new IP properties um, aimed at this teen demographic can now appear on any platform. Uh, Charlie Soko Like has more than 1.5 million subscribers on his uh, YouTube channel 
and his, view, his videos that he, he posts, posts every week, sometimes twice a week, can get up to six million views. Uh, that is more than most of the teen episodes that are broadcasted even on big countries like the US or Canada or UK. Uh, so now these properties can start online and not be dependable on networks and not dependable on studios. Um, the difference between kids, and I'll say kids until eight, nine, and teenagers, is that for kids, TV is still important. They go online, and Phineas and Ferb is one of the examples that succeed creating a very compelling online experience, but kids go online to, f to find the characters they watch on TV. They don't use search. They only go to places that they know. They want to meet the characters that they know. So when you prepare a, a property for a kid, TV is still a big and important element because you need to expose your demographic to that content so that they can go online and extend that engagement with your content using these online new tools. In the other hand, teens are a different, uh, have different behaviors because they don't need television to tell them what to look online. They, they like to search. They like to find things before everybody else. And this example, uh, Savannah, uh, is a new girl. Uh, she's been called the next Justin Bieber. And uh, she, was, she started in 2007. She posted a video online. And since then, she got more than 8 million videos. 8 million video views on, on YouTube. And she's not even signed, she doesn't have a record label, but she's already doing touring to the United States, and she already has her fan club, and more than 8 million views on YouTube. And she doesn't need radio, she doesn't need um, television, and she doesn't even need a record label to be popular and engage with her target audience. Does that doesn't mean that this is the end of television for teenagers. Um, I think the shift is not on the, on the TV content, but the way they consume content. It's like they prefer to watch it on demand than on the linear uh, broadcast. And as Donna said, they, they multitask. They don't want to just watch the content. They probably will be doing two or three tasks at the same time as this girl in the photo. And, uh, and in my generation, our generation, um, we only have a few channels and in Europe, and I think the States was not very different. And of course, everybody in the school watched the same show. So the day after when we go to school, we could discuss about last yesterday's show because we all always watched it and all watched that, the same episode. It doesn't happen anymore. Every single teenager consumes and watches different things. So this school backyard that was in our generation, the place where we could uh, sync our experience and discuss the same experience that we had at home doesn't exist anymore because now we need to go online and share this experience on these small niche communities that are created around the shows or around the properties that uh, teenagers like. And the um, difference between online and TV uh, and why kids go massively to YouTube and other social networks to try to to get their, their fix, the daily fix of snacks, is because TV shows becoming more and more aspirational, and um, most of the times TV shows don't answer the, the, the common teenage boys and girls. Like, if you are a 13 or 14 years old boy, you, know, you want to know how to talk with a girl, you want to know how to, to, to behave socially, or you want to know how to conquer a girl that you, you, you see in the school. And most of the schools don't have on their car park Rolls Royce or um, Lamborghini and Ferraris like in this 90210. So um, as teenagers love this dream and this, the, the, this fix of dream and expiration, they all, uh, always and they also need this fix of normal stuff that can answer their questions that they day on a daily basis. And if they don't get it on TV, they usually get it online. And, and this is why these online shows gives them other kids doing cool stuff, some outrageous stuff. And then these non-mainstream online shows are also a way for them to rebel against the mainstream because they can go and find things that nobody talks about. Some of the shows that I mentioned here before and dozens of others that exist online that connect with millions of teenagers worldwide, we don't know as an adult what is, what, what is successful. And they like to have the ones that discover that nobody knows and their parents don't know about because being teenager is, is about that. It's about discovering and about to be different and rebel against the establishment. I think the challenges ahead, and Donna already presented, is how can we mix this need for meat and need for snacks? How can we create content that can solve the teenagers' needs on a daily basis? So far, entertainment business is being oriented for one dominant platform. We go and create a television show, and if the television show exists, then we go and create it online, and if it succeeds, we may 
across to other platforms. And in most cases, this approach fails because um, there's hundreds of or dozens of TV shows that fail to get an online audience. Sometimes the online experience that studios and networks start are less popular than the, 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 the online communities that the fans of the show create and maintain. Uh, then we have online shows that started online then failed to cross to television. And it's very common that most of the games fail when they convert to, to TV and film. So the challenge is how can we create a strategy, a truly transmedia development strategy. So when we develop IP, we think about all the platforms our um, content can expand so uh, it can be deployed on several platforms. And don't forget that we live in a, in a very fast-paced world. So what is hot today will be... Uh, passed in, 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 in six months, in one year. So if you have a, a property like Angry Birds that is very su successful now and, and hit the, 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 it's becoming a pop culture icon, if you take two or three years to develop the next media that will be television and I think as a movie, it probably be too late when the movie come out because probably the audience for the Angry, Angry Birds already is find another cool thing to play or cool thing to, to, to follow. So we need, as this, this entertainment world moves so fast, to start thinking how can we create these properties and how can we create not just for one media, but how can we create for all the medias or several medias at the same time. Um, if you want to keep in touch, all the, social, the usual social media contacts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So these are the very clever people who know a little bit more about teams. Or, um, and um, we can talk to you. I mean, you can ask questions now already if you want. You can tweet some there if you're too shy. And um, we'll find out how they see all that. I mean, there's two things mainly to me is about the content and development. What does it mean for all of us, this new 360 approach and the money? So I don't want to know if you want to start with something. So basically, I'll maybe start with you. Um, so because the money is not coming mainly from the TV channels. Sorry. In our case, it, it doesn't come that way because uh, TV is still rigid in terms of how you develop property. Uh, it works on, with something that is very strange in the internet world that is called season. Uh, when I did Sophia's Diary in the UK for, for a major for Sony Pictures, it was very difficult to bring a show that we, we started small in Portugal and bring it to this very formatted world because it worked a season. So we only had money or we could only do something where we had, when we had a season paid by someone else. And it doesn't work online because communities can only exist when there is a season. Uh, communities exist 365 days uh, a year. So that was very difficult to bring this model of internet content and internet communities where audiences just want content every day, just want to connect every day with, with their favorite characters and their favorite stories. Uh, so we develop a different model. We work mostly with, with brands and advertisers. We've been lucky to work with the bigger uh, advertising companies in the world. We, we work with Unilever, with Porter & Gamble, some car manufacturers, some um, snack food manufacturers. In uh, China it's with Estee Lauder? Yeah, in China it was Estee Lauder and, and Clinique. In UK it was, was Skittles, was uh, sure girl at um, the other end from, from... So you can do what you want to reach. They give you the money. There's this new world of soap opera now. It is. It's, it's, soap opera started that way. This is why it's called soap opera. Was soap companies producing uh, content so they could put on daytime television and, and help them sell more, more soap. Uh, what we offer the, the, the brands and the advertisers is the fact that uh, teenagers are multitasking. They are not loyal to one platform. They, they are using the different platforms. So as our brands are connected to the content, not in the breaks of the content, for them it doesn't matter if our shows are pirate, if our shows are, if they skip the ads in the middle of our, of our, show, our shows, or if they consume on mobile, or on iPad, it just doesn't matter because if they are integrated in the show, whatever uh, the medium, or whatever the, the time of the day the show is consumed, the brand is always exposed. Um, very clever, Maurice asked, I mean, do we have less, um, less reach also because of that? If it's going around, it's maybe less, when you had 30% of the country watching something on the main station, you had maybe less viewers. But um, is that an issue? And you also get some money from someone else than just the channels to produce those shows. Sometimes you get also people involved with you. Thanks to the 360 approach, they are not just the TV station you work with, but there's also brands that are interested to the target teams. In terms of the um, American Idol and, instance, and, and that yeah, type yeah. of thing, yeah. I mean, we have sponsors on 
um, American Idol, we have Coke, uh, we have Ford, and Coke, um, whenever they come up with the, um, with the strategy um, for the promotion, Coke wants the 360. They don't want to just have the cup sitting in front of the judges. Um, you know, um, when uh, clips are put onto YouTube, because a lot of people will watch them there, Coke follows it there. When uh, the Facebook application, you know, Coke follows it there. So wherever you're experiencing American Idol, you're experiencing Coke. Um, that doesn't sound good, but um, but. Um, no, it's extraordinarily important for, it's for, for the viewers, for the sponsors, and you know, at the end of the day, for, for the broadcast networks. Um, you know, they, they definitely make their money by having you know, viewers watch it you know, at the time that they you know, have it on TV. But these days, I mean, they, everyone's putting their product onto Netflix. Everyone's putting their product. We put My Baby vs. Vampire onto iTunes 12 hours after it premieres on... Uh, on Disney Channel, and and we've you know sold a hundred thousand downloads of the, the same show that they could be watching for free, but they want it where they want it, and where they want it is on that thing sitting on the table right there, and that's where they kind of that's how they're able to see it. But what about the reach? Do you still reach as many eyeballs and and fingers? You said um, kids don't know how to watch TV without touching something. Mm -hmm. um, dot dot dot. <laughs> um, do you still reach as many? people as a few years ago where they weren't? I mean, is, do you feel like you get the numbers um, you need to... You know, uh, 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 oh, most oh, of the how, press talks I mean, about the, you know, how you know, kids are running away from TV or you're not watching as much TV. I think they're just experiencing it in different ways. Like I just said, if they're not watching it live, they're watching it TiVo, they're watching it on iPad, they're watching it on, on this thing. They're just... It, it's just much more bifurcated, but at the end of the day, they're all still seeing it, it's just where they see it and how they experience it. Someone's very funny, also we're getting your best quotes, because uh, experience in American Idol, you have to experience Coke. Um, <laughs> Coca-Cola is the right name of this. Um, yes, the... the uh, I totally agree with the fact that probably you will get less viewers on the live broadcast, and you, you see broadcast television is dropping numbers everywhere so less people are watching the, broad, the, 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 the traditional broadcast of the episode but we see people watching more television and if you count and if you if you add the numbers of people that watch it live the repeats the the the, the tivos and the hulus and then the the, the 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 piracy that exists and all the 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 youtube and if you add all the numbers that you get for one episode probably you have more views than you had five years ago mm. when you broadcast that, that, that episode, and uh, so, so, sorry, just to finish, I remember like two years, three years ago when the CW premiered Gossip Girl, and after I think the first 13 episodes, they were almost cutting the show because it was not getting the, 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 the ratings on linear broadcast television that they wanted. And then some reports came out and uh, Gossip Girl was like the second most pirate video on, on, on BitTorrent. And it got an audience, it just didn't get the audience where it, they wanted to, to be, but the show had an yeah. audience and then they go to the second season, third season, and then the, the ratings just grow and grow yeah. on, on TV. So it, it, it is still a lot and it's a richer also viewing, it's a different viewing also, it's an experiencing of, of, of the media content. Exactly. Well, I was going to make two points. One is, ten years ago I was head of Kids WB at the time that Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! were big hits. And we had lots of internal debates about whether or not we should share that show with Cartoon Network, which was our sister company. But at the time, frankly, there was a big rivalry between Cartoon and, and um, Kids so WB. Still, you still went for the lunch today? No, well, I'm, now everybody's friends. <laughs> yes. um, but at the time, you know, it was a big, you know, we were the broadcast network. Should we have the premiere? Should we have the exclusive? And, you know, was sharing a good thing? Or were we, were we going to bifurcate our audience? And very quickly we learned that ubiquity wins. And I think today, you know, it's not just, I mean, you want to get an audience everywhere, every place that you possibly can. And I think the, the point that Christoph just made is really important. You know, kids today want to really engage, you know, just what we talked about, they want to play with your brand, they want to live your brand, they want to wear your, your property, um, and they want to they control it. You know, they want to, 
Um, they want to create around it. They want to build their own user jet. You know, they want to make you know, fake YouTube videos of you know, re rewriting the lyrics of your theme songs and things like that. So the more you give them control and an ability to interact with your brand, your property, um, the more connected they will be. It's, it's obviously it's also scary for the TV brands, the channel brands, because it's, if it's not just happening on them, I mean, they, have, they need to attach their name also to you know, the, the, the idols or, or uh, so if they paid for it because they also want to keep people coming back to them. So it's a bit of a, of a difficult juggle. But there was a, one question which is also interesting. What's you think the key factor for something that emerged somewhere online, got 18 million views, to go into a bigger um, element of the 360, to go into TV, for instance? Where, where do, when do you think something happens to say, oh, it's worthwhile to invest now and make it uh, from this little thing that someone did in his room to a bit more and to the TV show? I think in some cases, it, it doesn't translate. And I think the, the, the biggest mistake we, we've been doing in, in, in the past four or five years, especially in the US, where we see lots of shows trying to, to cross, and we have this William Shatner show the, based on, on the Twitter. Some things don't translate. Some things exist on one medium. And in some of these internet sensations, they, are, they work, they, 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 they tick all the boxes for, the, for, the, for their target audience, for the teenagers, when they exist online. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to translate for, for different mediums. Uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't use this approach. We, we use this approach. We try to see things online, but then we, when we prepare a, a new property, we always remember that it's, you, need to be, you need to follow the rules of each medium. Uh, and we, uh, we were discussing this at lunch, when we have Sophia's that existed during the week online and then we have a TV show on the, on the, on the weekend, Probably the story is the same, but when we watch it online, it's more about her inner voice, about her talking in her room to the audience. Because when you go online, this is what you expect. You expect one-to-one -one experience because you are in your room alone looking at the, uh, at the computer, so you have a one-to-one -one experience. When we have the television show, it's not about telling, it's about showing. Because you probably are in the living room and probably you have your parents or your, your aunt or uncle watching with you. So you need to follow the rules, the rules of each medium. And, uh, and I think that's where we do some mistakes as an industry, try to cross between the mediums and forgetting that each media has their own rules and the audience has different expectations for each of the medium. Uh, yeah, I, I, do you think it will change a lot, the, the content development, when now you, you're the head of creative at Fermenti, so how does that all change your views on, I have to write a story, I have to have shiny characters, I have to have, how do you, what do you think the 360 changed in your job? Um, what it changes is, um, you know, how we approach it. But in terms of the characters and the stories, that stays the same largely. You, all, the characters are always going to need to, um, you know, really touch and relate to the intended audience. Um, and, and to, you know, think that because you're doing little short form bits online, you can short form your characters. You can't. They really need to be as you know, Donna used the, the, the hamburger thing there. They need to be as meaty, you know, online as they are on TV. Um, you know, an example, it's not something that we did, but um, if you guys know who Fred is, Fred was this, you know, kid from Lincoln, Nebraska in the middle of the United States who created this, you know, kid named Lucas Cruikshank. He created this character named Fred who was the most annoying, you know, little character in the world, but he was actually a really meaty character when you got into it. This kid created an entire backstory for him and an entire universe that he lived in. And he would do these little, um, you know, completely self-generated, you know, talking to camera episodes. And kids loved it and they engaged with it. And then what happened was Nickelodeon came along because he was getting, you know, 10 million views per episode. A kid in Lincoln, Nebraska was getting higher ratings than most of the stuff on the CW. You know, and, um, and, and they did a movie, you know, a, a Fred movie on Nickelodeon. Fantastic, but this is also really showing, it, it blurs the, 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 the frontier between reality and fiction. Because more and more of the reality is actually getting, you said, the backstory. Uh -huh. You talked about your fake movie. Sophia's, Sophia's diary told me about how to, you couldn't get an actress. You had to get someone who was not known and you cast it and all that. So it's the, 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 the genre between fiction and um, reality TV in this 360 has really merging more and more. But what's so interesting 
No, or, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say what's so interesting about that is, you know, again, just thinking about what's going on in teens' lives today, they are changing who they are every single day. That line between what is the reality and fiction of who Donna is changes depending upon, you know, how I want to present myself to the world. So, you know, in that kind of subtlety that I was talking about before and playing with those kinds of boundaries is exactly the kind of rich, interesting content that teens are looking for because that's what's going on for themselves. They are living their lives out loud in a very powerful and scary, I think for grown-ups kind of way. Um, but for them, it's like they're figuring out who they are on screen. Mm -hmm. And so I think these kinds of shows that, that play with these issues really connect. So it, it's the heart of their being, really. Yeah. It's at the heart of their being, and that's why, I mean, Read Me Them and a little bit of me kind of got the right theme with that, because really the, the teens will change all that, this area of the 360. Mm -hmm. They will make it happen further, I think. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm a very bad Twitter, yeah, for instance, but uh, you are very good there. <laughs> Thank you, continue. <laughs> Yes, but I, I, I think the issue is not about faking it, as, 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 as you were mentioned, but it's about, I think... Not faking, playing. No, no playing. Playing. It, it is, it, 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 but on. I think it's about character development, because when you go online, you interact with real people. Characters need to have depth. I think characters need to have more depth online than probably on television, because you are interacting with them. You, you, you want to talk with them, so you, you need to know who they are. In one of our shows, we, we asked the actors to bring photos since they were babies because we needed to create all this backstory for the characters visually and with text because when people go interact with them they needed to be real living entities not that we we are faking it but we need to create these worlds we need to create these characters because people go online to communicate they don't want just to to to, to listen to stories they like characters they like to interact with other people so we need to make them real uh, preparing this i also heard of the story of uh, this um, Portugal channel is actually changing its cast every year. The same format, but it's, they, they call for a new cast and they change the cast every year, but it's still the same format. That's also new. You wouldn't have done, not have done that before this, this happening in... in, in, in yes, in we were discussing about this show that translated in, in English is like strawberries with sugar. And I think they are very clever. We had that problem with Sophia because we were telling this story about this girl that was growing in real time with the audience. So we could only do like three or four seasons because then she becomes too old. And I think they figure out a way to avoid us with teen shows, that is change the cast every single year so we can have fresh face and they never get too old because there is every new talent every single year. Um. Is TV, is, is um, YouTube now really, it's great, I, I can, it's a very easy job for me now. <laughs> Thanks, Maurice. Is, um, <laughs> is YouTube just a tasting ground for TV movie and movies, or can it be an end goal in its own right? Because you make, mo you make money now. A few years ago, I remember hosting these was painful, because <laughs> they were great, they looked fab, but they had no money. And it was like everyone came and pitied them and said, fine, do whatever you want, but we still make the money in TV. Now you do some money, you get a lot of sponsors as much as you want, so you don't need TV. And um, so is, do you think it's going to be just a tasting ground or there's also a new content that's happening there and that would just be there, originally there, staying there? I think, you I you think told me that you now also you have a department developing also at Fremantle just for the non-TV, the non-linear. Well, they do, you know, they, we will develop stuff for non-TV. We're developing apps, we're trying, you know, can we create the next Angry Birds, you know, and, and then raise it up through, through the rest of the media. Um, same thing, um, it's not a teen property, but we're developing a, a web series that we hope, you know, in success, will become something bigger. But it felt right to start as little short bits. Um, uh, to, uh, Disney Channel, when I was at the last company I was at, Wild Brain, um, we made these things called Team Smithereen. Um, which were just these one minute gag things. And they never sh would have worked well on TV because it was just kind of the immediacy and, and just the splat in your face of the gag and being able to, actually what's great with, with it being online is um, kids can then control how fast and how slow they watch something and if they want to pause something and kind of look at it and that's, that show in particular just had a lot of physical humor in it that kids want to kind of stop and, and see that little Three Stooges moment over and over again. Um, and now they're actually trying to turn that into a TV show. Um, so, so I think it, you know, 
we are developing stuff, but we're also taking, you know, like I said earlier, with, with the X Factor and, and, um, and Idol, what we do a lot of is once something is working really well, okay, now how do we redevelop it for the rest of the media and how do we make it unique for the rest of the media and what can you know we do that they can't experience um, on American Idol you know on American Idol they can't sit there and say happy birthday to everyone in the audience but you can do that on American Idol on Facebook they can send you you know for a dollar um, a happy birthday message you know that you get from Chris Allen or whoever you know happens to be on, on American Idol at the time so I just to answer Maurice's question, I would say from a teen's point of view, YouTube is its own thing. You know, I mean, YouTube is... And, and Tini Angela says it's like even better than TV. TV is like internet, but not as good. Right. Do you, you think know, that some teens think that? Probably, yes. You know, one of the things that we also, we did a really interesting study last year on transmedia and the role it plays in, in teens' lives, and actually kids. We looked at um, kids seven to 14, and one of the things that we uncovered was that, you know, at seven, kids are still interested in prepackaged franchises. So, you know, give me Harry Potter, give me Star Wars, I'm going to want all of it. Um, at 10, they're starting to transition between prepackaged franchises and starting to create their own. You know, it's like I'm into sports, so I'm going to watch, you know, this television show and play this video game, but I'm also going to play sports. By 13, what we discovered is that kids were really creating their own transmedia narratives around the stuff that they cared about. So, you know, if I'm 13 years old and my parents are getting divorced, the transmedia narrative that I'm going to be living, you know, might be about divorce. And I can get that, you know, in part from this book and in part from that movie and in part from this, um, you know, television show. It's not necessarily like wrapped in a neat little bow like you and I are going to make for them. And I think that's really important to know. Um, we almost need to be a little bit subversive in the way that we, you know, teens don't want to be marketed to by big media companies. They want, they want to engage with characters and stories that they love, they but they want to own it, yeah. you know? And, they, and they'll mush other stuff into it. Um, so I just think that's important for us. You know, it's very easy to be in our little box and real, like, look at the world from our point of view as producers, but it's really important to look at the world from their point of view. Uh, yeah. I'm glad you they sing. are yeah. king. Yeah. I'm, glad you, I'm glad you're saying as producer, I thought you meant as, as old people. <laughs> to compare to, teen, to teens. Well, one, one, one thing is, as you were just talking, um, you know, there's this thing out there um, called fan fiction, and that's one thing I think teens do a lot when you were talking about, you know, they wanted to make their own. Kids and teens, and they do it in writing, and now they're starting to do it on YouTube, will create their own versions of the shows that are on TV. So they'll, they're engaged so closely with these characters that they're creating, like, alternate realities other than what the writers on TV are putting on. They're like, you know, we want to see this character go over here and start, you know, dating this guy and doing this thing. And then you'll see other teens latch onto that and they create entire storylines for themselves and for other fans to kind of latch onto. And I just find it interesting because, you know, it, it, it's, it's just a whole different way of, of engaging. And, and Jeff Gomez, who's kind of one of the gurus of the transmedia world, he, he would say that in true transmedia, there's room for the audience to help build the canon, mm -hmm. you know, so. And wh what about the games? Because um, you mentioned Angry Birds. Um, someone said earlier in the, f in the tweet, two years, forget it, it's too, too long even. You said two years, or you said two years uh, later, even maybe less. And uh, someone asked uh, already Fremantle to create the next Angry Birds. What is the influence of this huge now? It's as big as... TV and, and music together of the video games culture in what you're doing. Is that, is that influencing already what you're doing? Are you looking at that, Omar? Yes, I think um, we live in a world of uh, dominated by gamification. And I think Angry Birds and uh, the Farmville brought video games to, to, to the real world. And not just something for teenage kids that play on their consoles, but something that everybody likes to play. I think my uh, one of the most impressive moments. I was in Brazil watching a Slava Snow show, a sort of like Cirque du Soleil show, and we had the show, the show was nice, and then in the end, the, 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 uh, the clowns in, in the stage show ended, lights on, and they throw like six, seven big balls to the audience, and then the audience stay there, play for half an hour. We were grown-ups 
50, 40, 30 years old people, some 80 year old people, and we stay there after the show playing with just big balls. And, um, and I think everybody likes to play. Everybody uh, has these children inside and likes to play with, with simple things. And I think Farmville and Angry Birds and other casual games that are out there brings that notion. And I think now games is not just for a niche, but it's for everybody. Yeah, and have you, have you thought of like, things like a Sims soap or um, <laughs> these kind of things? Do you, do you um, not The Sims, but I mean, we definitely look at what's hot in games and gaming, and you know, is it something that we think can become can become a TV show, can become more than just a game, and should it? I mean, you certainly see a lot of movies that are made out of games, and they should never have been done. Um, <laughs> but it's because oh, it's popular as this, so it has to be popular as that, and that's not always true. Um, sometimes things that you know, I. I Unfortunately, I can't think of an example right off the top of my head that didn't do extraordinarily well, you know, in one media, but for some reason made the leap and did extraordinarily well in another. I mean, it, it, it's happened. Um, but no, we, yeah, we look at games, we look at everything and try to decide, you know, is there a reason for this to become a TV show and a good TV show? And if the answer is yes, then we'll try and pursue it. And if the answer is no, then we don't. I and mean, it's, it's also the things like like dislike. Now you always have an opinion. I mean, on Facebook. Does that change also? So I've got a um, very good assistant there who asked me, um, ask you, like, does that change also? Do you, can you bump a character? He got, he got a lot of dislike on his Facebook page. Well, it depends on if the character was intended to be disliked. You know? If, if people are, like, disliking your villain, that's a good thing. Um, uh -huh. But, I, you know, I, I think it definitely can help if you see people, um, you know, we talked about the Gossip Girl thing. If you see something working over here, you definitely have to pay attention to it. It's almost like a form of research, in a way. And, and to ignore it and to ignore the audience um, would be really short-sighted. So yeah, you definitely look at it. On, on Sophia's, the show was interactive. In the end of each episode, you could decide what the character will do in the next one. And what we learned is basically that. If you do your job right, they will love the lead character, they will hate the antagonist. Mm -hmm. and it, it, you have to listen, but not truly listen, because if you listen for everything that the audience says, oh, yeah. uh, they will just kill the antagonist, the character will have a wonderful <laughs> life, but there will be no drama and there will be no story. Okay, there's still a role for the producer. There is, for us. Hallelujah. <laughs> um, should the channels then not just be channels? Should you, I mean, in, in an ideal world for you, and for you, I don't know, like lovely Sheila is sitting here, she should not just have a channel, but she should have the channel plus her online world. So where you can do all that together with her for this for this group, right? I, I think yes. We, we we work. I think the notion of network changes is for us. A network is not just a TV network. We are working. We work in the past like with Bebo, and we are working now with other networks that are just probably but, but, YouTube networks. But do you work with all guys like me? Yes, I'm we're working with for Sheila too. for <laughs> or you work with for Sheila? Oh, <laughs> didn't know Sheila. Sorry. <laughs> But um, yeah, so do you, so you work with them in this, not just for the TV, but also for the 360. I work for the audience. For the 359. One percent TV is 359. No, but I, I work for the audience. I I I want to have my shows where the audience is, and the audience is also on television, the same way they are online and the same way they are on mobiles. And that's actually obviously one of the trickiest parts of our business is you know all the big media companies you know, traditionally have been siloed and television sits on one floor and online sits on another and, you know, slowly but surely everybody's trying to figure out how to bring this all together. Um, but it's hard, you yeah. know, and the other piece that's hard um, is that, you know, not every, I mean, again, Bob is a brilliant television producer and has done this for a very long time. Would he be the best game producer? No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, can we all have, you know, so that, that's what's tricky also. Do you, you don't want to be the geeks. I mean, I work for Ubisoft, they're weird. But they're nice, <laughs> but they've got a lot of money, but they're weird. <laughs> <laughs> and they're very technology driven. You know, what's exactly. okay today in six months might not be, because right. technology plays a huge role there. Yeah, no, I've, yeah. I've, had, I've had that as well. Um, but it's, so it's tricky. I'd, there might be some people who don't have tweet things, and if they want to ask questions, just traditionally raise your hands. Do not, be outed as old, you can just say, I don't have my tweets here, but if you want to ask questions, you can. Um, because I, otherwise, we'll very be closing that soon. Yes? Uh, Don, I was just wondering, do you do your research in various territories and cultures? Absolutely. So the, the mic is coming, darling, so you can. Oh. Thank you. 
Uh, I just want to ask Donna if she did her research in various cultures and what some of the most distinctive differences might be between the teens, say, in various yeah. European and versus U.S. territory. You know, I, I didn't feel, to be honest, we, we have a growing international business and we've done a lot of kids and family work around the world for companies like Nickelodeon and Hasbro and, and many others. But in the teen space, honestly, I, we have not done as much work specifically in teens and that's why I didn't speak to teens as a global, um, from a global perspective. So I really don't feel qualified. We would love to do the work and it was interesting because Christoph asked me, you know, did I have global data on how teens are spending their time or how, you know, what platforms or money? And what's interesting is the data is not out there. Nobody's doing it. We would love to do it. So if anybody wants to partner with us to do it, we would love to. Um, but, you know, people aren't looking at it and they should be. Um, so. Thank you. Yeah. There's, a, there's a, 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 a lawyer asking all the time, and we should then ask it because shy and not asking it loud, but is there an issue with the rights for the UGC? Uh, the user-generated content. So, I mean, quick, briefly, and then we'll get to this to your question. Um, it, you know, it depends. Honestly, it it depends on um, you know it, if it's a pirated thing, if they're just kind of you know putting. If it's original, you can go and buy. <laughs> if it's original, really. If it's not pirated, but right. if it's someone like the the kids you've been talking about, you can mm -hmm. go there and make a deal. They can, yeah, I mean, you know, as long as they're not profiting from it, as long as they're not, um, you know, taking your property and and making their own business out of it, you know, I think it's a good thing. Um, if it became an issue, you know, there's certainly ways, even on YouTube, where you know you you can have it taken down, um, and they will take it down. Um, but um, you know, I, I think kids and and teens and fans engaging with your stuff and talking about it, and you know, Donna said. You know, ubiquity. I mean, you, that's a good thing. The fact that they care that much, you know, it's a really good thing that they will spend their time, you know, promoting you and your show and your brand. So the days of and, and <laughs> clamping and, down on uh, yeah. people. And you, and you yeah. don't take yeah. UGC and, and do something out of it. It's you creating it. Yes, and but sometimes we, we ask the users to participate, and uh, as long as you don't try to sell something that you didn't create, so, so if you try to sell something that your fans created, then probably you have a problem. But if you if you create a community and you allow the users to to create their own content and feed it online, there is no 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 no, no copyright infringement right. for, because you're not using because the, they are just posting it online. I think the problems arise if you then. You want to use that on your TV show? Then Good. problems could. could I'm glad. Happen. I'm glad we had an MD on the panel. They could have an answer, a serious answer. <laughs> yes. My question is, if kids are not so concerned about what platform they're getting their content from, and if that's great news for advertisers because they really want to touch as many people as possible, for us as producers, distributors, content creators. In the end, it's really the content that we're selling, which is the creative aspect. And I think that as creators, producers, we don't know how to contact sponsors to pay for anything because broadcasters are used to putting up most of the budget and we've learned over the years how to sing their song, but how we don't know anything. Of course, Idol can go out and get Coke, but most of us in here are not Fremantle or Idol, so how do we go about engaging a sponsor so that a broadcaster will not be, feel threatened that we're bringing in a sponsor that's going to have anything to do with the content because people who pay for things want to be involved. How, how did you get your first deal? Uh, how did you I, 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 was, I have to tell that I came from an advertising world, so I knew a little about the world, so that, of course, helps. Uh, of course, to, 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 you always need two things. You need someone that will distribute your content, be it a broadcaster or an internet portal, and you always need someone that pays for it. And what we've been doing is combining both. So when we go to a media agency, we never go directly to the company, so we go to the media agencies. We present a package that includes the content that we want to produce, but also uh, uh, includes like a distribution package. So they know when they invest money in our show, that show will be seen 
by X amount of people because we have some distribution partner that somehow guarantee that that show will have this impact with an audience. Uh, I think that that's what you need to do. You need to be more, probably more entrepreneur than uh, the, the, the usual TV producer where we go for one place and we sell our ideas, they give us a check and then in the end we deliver tapes and then we allow them to market and distribute the show and then if it works, uh, it's because we are good producers. If it doesn't work, it's because the, the broadcaster uh, didn't schedule it right. I think nowadays, in this world of uh, multi-platform content, you need it to be more an entrepreneur. You need to go on alternative sources of, fun of funding, being it um, IT funding, being it private equity, being it uh, advertising. Um, I think you need, we, we need to do more work, probably for less money. My suggestion would be you go on Facebook, find your studies friends who are now in the in, in in that world like like the planners or the in in, in the in the advertising world and you talk to them and they help you and then then you've got the nice little plan with that yeah you need the help of someone who really understands the advertising plan when i was in my channel i had all the time this guy telling me how many eyeballs do you promise me and all that you need to do that for i'm preparing that show i want to go to that target i will have these partners um hopefully these channels and online I'll do that and then I think we'll have at minimum of that amount of people dealing with it, watching it and um, you should invest money in it. No, no, no. I said you ask a friend, ask a friend to help you on that. <laughs> uh, and uh, but still do your show. You have to write the, what the show will be, the concept. That doesn't change. And then, Yes, it is more difficult. I mean, yes, today it's more difficult. I'm so glad I'm not a broadcaster anymore. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Much, a farmer is much better, I tell you. <laughs> or it, it's, it's so complex because you also have to defend your ground. You have to make sure uh, YouTube is, doesn't, doesn't overtake you too much. I mean, MTV, a few years ago, my, my friends at MTV were like the superheroes. <sighs> they had trouble. So it's difficult. And I guess for the producers, it's the same. I think it's, you still will need... The, the, the main channels uh, to pay for it. Uh, you still need the subsidies uh, of your country to develop the right content. And you'll need, uh, now you've got the new people that might be able to pay for it, uh, the Coke or the Unilever. Are we going to go to the end of that? A part of a very, very clever question, no pressure. Uh, maybe asking you, uh, f what do you think the next trend is for you? What's the next thing? You anticipate, it's a, I know it's a silly question, but uh, what do you think might come in this teens 360 world? What do you anticipate a little bit? Don't know, you want to start, Bob? Or Donna, you're the research person. Sure. <laughs> um, you know, a couple of things that we're seeing from the teens that we're talking to right now. One is actually DIY, so do-it-yourself content. Um, because, again, it fits with that theme of that teen superhero, you know, that superhero complex, they can do it all. It also ties into that identity um, creation, you know, they can m turn over their rooms into what they want. So DIY is something that you might not think of immediately when you think of teens, but it's something that we're starting to see kind of up and coming. Um, another is the sort of notion of awkwardness. There's actually a show on MTV that's doing very, very well right now that's called Awkward. And that just kind of, again, that's where these kids, kids are at. Um, and so authenticity and smart and layered, you know, if 10 years ago, you know, Beavis and Butthead was sort of the symbol of, you know, dumb, you know when you think teens, you thought dumb. Nowadays, think teens, think smart. Um, you know, really sort of smartening up your content for that audience. It may appear dumb on the outside, like South Park or Family Guy, but they're actually very, very smart and layered underneath. Yeah. Um, I mean, my kind of quick and honest answer to that is, is I have no idea. Um, but I think, honestly, nobody does. If we all did, you know, we'd be rich as hell and, Just a and not sitting guess here. What you're interested in? Um, yeah, I, what I what I, what I'm pretty certain of though is it's not going to be something that's already copying what's already out there and you know doing it's kind of like well that worked I'll do that too because you end up just being a big me too thing and really the things that break out are the things that take risks um, so I think whatever is the next big thing is going to be something that you know nobody here suspects is coming and it's going to be kind of risky and different and it's going to strike a chord it's true yeah totally agree i think that that's i think the authenticity i think teenagers 
love that, love to feel something that is real and that some connects with them and, and re represents what they are facing on, a, on their daily, daily life. So thank you very, very much. Thanks for this wonderful panel. I just wanted to give a little plug to my old company, National Geographic. Uh, this is the cover of National Geographic magazine right now. Um, <laughs> no, no, they didn't I, pay anything no, for that. But it's just very, very interesting. It's called yes. The New Science of the Teenage Brain. Um, so I just thought it was very relevant. Yes, good. Very well. We thank you very, very much to Donna, Bob, and Nuno. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here. See you soon. Thank you.